we very rarely hear addressed in the pulpit. I don't get scared, it's not controversial. But it is difficult, and it's a topic that I think, frankly, a lot of preachers are afraid to address. And it's not that I'm anything special or bold or courageous or anything like that. It's just something that speaks very intimately and personally to my life and my experience. And so you pray that the Lord will help me as I try to talk to you on the topic of pain tonight. If I ask for a show of hands as to how many of you were in some way, shape, or form experiencing pain tonight, it probably would be a near unanimous vote. Now, if we were to analyze circumstance by circumstance, situation by situation, I'm sure that we would find some are much more deeply painful than others. But on the other hand, it's really a fool's errand to try to start comparing pain with pain. Because a lot of that has to do with where you are in life, what you've experienced so far, what seems painful Deeply painful, earth-shatteringly painful to a young person may not seem like all that big a deal to an older person that's lived a whole lot of life. But to that person in that place, it's very deep and very hurtful. And so I try to sort of disregard any sort of comparison of painful situations. Pain is pain. And God wants to help us not to waste our sorrows. God has a purpose in our pain. Amen? I want you to turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. How many of you remember Albert Barr? Quite a few of you. I remember him preaching from this passage, not along the lines that I'll be preaching to you tonight, But I remember him saying that the Apostle Paul must have been a Southerner. And I just realized that I told you the wrong chapter. No, 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 no. I'm I'm, I'm right. I'm sorry. It's Romans chapter 8. We're just starting at verse 18, not at verse 1. I'm sorry. I'm I'm goofed up here. I got ahead of myself. (laughs) Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Brother Barr used to say the Apostle Paul had to be a Southerner because he starts this passage out saying, for I reckon. (laughs) Actually, that was the King James translators that did that. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the sons of God, excuse me, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. That word travaileth has the sense of labor pangs. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. In other words, pain is no respecter of persons. Pain happens to all of us. All of us are anticipating the redemption that is coming when we will be set free from the pain of this fallen world. Even we, ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. I love this portion. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Do you realize that if we could eavesdrop on the throne room of heaven tonight, what we would hear is God the Son and God the Holy Spirit 
calling our names before the throne of the Heavenly Father. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> oh, I love that, don't you? And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Let's say verse 28 together. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Lord Jesus, we need you tonight. You see the folk here, you see their needs, you see their hurts, you see their sorrows, you see their griefs, their traumas. And Lord, you know how Satan plays upon these things. Even in the heart and mind of the elderly saint, Lord, he can bring doubts, he can bring questioning, he can bring uncertainty and instability. Lord, I just pray in the precious name of Jesus, that you would sanctify to us our deepest distresses. Lord, that you would bring forth your purpose in our pain. And for all that you do, we'll praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word, said she. But oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. I have a cousin whose name is Kenny. Some of you know my cousin, Kenny Stetler. Kenny's a big guy now. He's taller than me, and I'm happy to say he's wider than me. <laughs> that didn't used to be the case. No, when Kenny was a little fella, he was just the cutest little guy in the world. Light blonde hair, bright blue eyes, and he had a personality to match. He just lit up a room. He had people eating out of his hand. He would tell jokes and his eyes would sparkle, and he reminded me of his granddaddy, Egan. How many of you knew Brother Egan? Quite a few of you. Oh, yes, what a man. Little Kenny. One day, little Kenny scraped his knee or foot or something on something that was rusty. I don't know if it was a barbed wire fence or a nail, but my Aunt Regina had to take him to the doctor's office to get a tetanus shot. How many of you have ever had a tetanus shot? Probably most of us. She took him to that doctor's office and he walked in and he was charming the people in the waiting room, smiling at them, grinning at them, laughing at them, telling stories. After a while, the nurse came and she poked her head in the door and said, Mrs. Stetler, we're ready for you to come back now. And so she began to take Kenny back the hall and they went into the room and sat him down on the reclining chair and he was charming the nurse. Oh, she thought he was the cutest little thing. Big smile on his face until she pulled out that needle. She pumped the air out of it, and then started moving in his direction. Now, you've got to understand, my Aunt Regina is a southern belle. She taught her kids proper southern manners. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. When that needle started coming in his direction, that smile vanished. And the next thing you know, Kenny was hollering, No! <laughs> My Aunt Regina was horrified. She said, Kenny, where are your manners? <laughs> and he paused for a moment. He said, no, thank you! <laughs> you know, if Kenny's little boy mind could have grasped two concepts, he could have dealt with that oncoming pain a little better. First of all, there was an end in sight, right? Much as we hate those needles, that prick is oh so quick, right? And then it's over. 
There was an end in sight. Secondly, there was a goal in mind. Little boys scraped their knees on rusty things. Little boys could get deathly ill from scraping their knees on rusty things if it weren't for tetanus shots. Thank God for tetanus shots. You could go septic if it weren't for tetanus shots, right? My Aunt Regina was being a loving, responsible mother by taking him to get a potentially life-saving tetanus shot. There was a goal in mind. Now, friends, I know that's painfully simple. But if we could learn to approach our painful situations with those two concepts in mind, it will help us also face our pain and frame our pain as God would have us do. Anytime we're confronted with a painful situation, there is an end in sight. Hallelujah. <laughs> and God always has a goal in mind. Don't waste your sorrows. Amen? When considering pain, it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of perspective. First of all, it's a matter of perspective on our pain itself. The Apostle Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to come. Not only is eternal life so infinitely vast and this life so incredibly short, so just in the sheer sense of time, it's hardly even a worthy comparison. But when you add to that the fact that the pain of this life can be used to enhance the glory of what is to come, that sheds a whole new light on our pain, doesn't it? God wants us to have a proper perspective on our pain. Do you realize that your God concept will to some extent dictate your response to pain? If you view God as a tyrant who is toying with humanity, perhaps torturing humanity or callously sitting by and allowing terrible things to happen without intervening, pain will make you bitter. I don't know what kind of a father you had, Maybe some of you had an abusive father. Maybe some of you had an absent father. Maybe some of you were abandoned by your father. Maybe he died when you were young. Let me just pause and say that if that is the case with you, I have good news for you. God has special grace for those who had either a bad father or no father. You know what the Bible says? I will be a father to the fatherless. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> God himself will step in and fill that void in your life if you'll let him. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. But I have to say, I'm thankful for my earthly father because I had a good dad. I had a dad that loved me. Oh, that didn't mean he didn't discipline me. Let me tell you. <laughs> there are plenty of times when he started taking off that belt. Son, get down by the couch and bend over. And wow, he put a licking on me and I needed it. I was recently at a speaking engagement in a conservative holiness setting. And I was talking to some young parents after the service. And the subject of discipline came up. And they quickly made it clear to me that they did not believe in corporal punishment. In other words, in any kind of physical punishment. And I bit my lip because I wanted to respond, oh, so you're telling me that you trust pop psychology more than the Word of God? Because the Word of God specifically instructs parents to discipline 
physically. And I thank God for a father who was willing to do that. But I always knew that my dad loved me. I always knew that his discipline was not in anger, it was in love. I thank God for a good earthly father who gave me a wonderful picture of my heavenly father that helped me to later gain a perspective on my pain. The songwriter said, help me Lord when toil and trouble meeting, heir to take as from a father's hand. Oh, friends, we have a loving Heavenly Father. <laughs> I was born with a handicap. Now, some of you, after talking to me, may think it was mental, but it was not, I promise. <laughs> no, I was born with a physical handicap. My, my parents were standing beside my baby bed one night, and they were watching as I began to try to pull myself up for the first time. My baby bed had little spindles on it. And they watched as I, with my chubby little hands, grasped those spindles and started to pull myself up on my pudgy little legs for the first time. And they were encouraging me along, but when I finally stood up and they were cheering, they looked down at my feet. Instead of standing on the bottoms of my feet, I was standing on the sides of my feet. Dad looked at Mom and he said, Joan, does that look right to you? She said, no. First thing in the morning, they called the doctor. An appointment was made. Back then, you could get an appointment reasonably soon. <laughs> they took me to the doctor, and the doctor began to massage my little legs. Dad said as he dug his thumb knuckles into my shins, and I began to pucker up and cry. It was all he could do to keep from grabbing that doctor and saying, Stop hurting my son. But he said, I knew it was for your good. The doctor came back with this verdict. He said, I have good news and bad news. He said, the bad news is your son has clubbed feet. And he said, it's a very serious condition that could cripple him for life if untreated. He said, the good news is it is treatable. And if you'll do exactly what I say, he will be able to run and walk and play like every other little boy. My parents were all ears. The doctor came back into the room with a pair of strange looking shoes. The shoes curved outward instead of inward. The shoes had metal fittings on the soles. He had a metal bar that attached to those fittings on the soles of those shoes. And he showed my dad how to attach them. And he said, you have to put this apparatus on your son every night if he is to recover from this condition and develop normally. That first night, my mom refused to be involved. She made dad do it. <laughs> and so dad put those little shoes on me. And then he began to spread apart my little legs and he attached the bar to one side and then he clicked it into place on the other side and he put me down in the bed and he said, you could see the look of pain on my face. Now, you know how vulnerable a little child is. You know how a little child just instinctively trusts its parents, right? He said, I began to try to turn and then began to squirm and then began to cry out in pain. And he said, I looked at him with the most pitiful look as though to say, Daddy, why are you hurting me? Dad said, I stood there and wept like a child. And he said, as the tears ran down my face, I began to talk to you, even though I knew you couldn't understand. And he said, I said, son, I'm doing this so that you won't be crippled, so that you won't have to have surgery after surgery, so that you can run and jump and play like other little boys. I'm doing this because I love you. There's another young woman in our church her family was connected with our church at least. She became pregnant around 15 years of age. She was woefully unprepared for motherhood. Her little girl was also born with clubbed feet. She took her child to the doctor. They got the same verdict. 
She brought the apparatus home. That night, she began to put it on her little girl's legs and feet. And when her little girl cried out in pain, she said, I'm too good a mom to hurt my daughter. She took them off. You know, last I heard that woman, she's a grown woman now, has had surgery after surgery after surgery and still doesn't walk properly. Now let me ask you tonight, who was the better parent? The one who was willing to inflict pain for a purpose. It's a matter of our perspective on our pain but it's also a matter of our perspective on our Heavenly Father. My sister Julia and I, for years, have sung a song, a song that has touched many people. We've gotten text messages and emails and Facebook messages and we've had people come up to us in person and grab our hands and sometimes with tears in their eyes say, that song touched me deeply. I never fully understood that until I walk through my own valley of the shadow of death. But these are the words. He sees the master plan. He holds the future in his hands. So don't live as those who have no hope, for our hope is found in him. <laughs> we see the present clearly. Oh, but he sees the first and the last. And like a tapestry, he's weaving you and me to one day be just like him Amen. and the chorus is so wonderful <laughs> it says god is too wise to be mistaken god is too good to be unkind so when you don't understand when you don't see his plan when you can't trace his hand you can trust his heart <laughs> hallelujah have you ever seen a tapestry before? If you look at the top side, you see one thing. But if you look at the underside, oh, you see something different, don't you? When you're looking at the underside, what you see is a confusing mess of threads. Dangling threads, knotted threads, seemingly confused threads. Some of them are bright and cheerful. Some of them are dark and ominous. Friends, we're currently looking at the underside of the tapestry. But one of these days, God's going to extend his loving hand and he's going to say, son, daughter, <laughs> it's time to come on up a little higher. And at that point, we're going to see the top of the tapestry. And what we will see is the work of art that God, the master craftsman, has been making all along. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> And you know what we'll realize in that moment? We'll realize that the dark threads were necessary in order to create the picture that only he could create. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, it's a matter of our perspective on God. For now we see through a glass darkly, Paul says, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known hallelujah <laughs> that's why it's so important to keep his face in view the songwriter said turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace Amen. on that fateful day in 2019 november 22nd We'd gotten a good night's sleep the night before. We'd gotten up at a reasonable time. All of our I's were dotted. All of our T's were crossed. We were driving on a straight, flat section of Interstate 95. We had the cruise control on at a reasonable speed. We both had our seat belts on. We were in the slow lane. It was mid-morning, my best time to drive. She was asleep in the passenger seat so that she could relieve me around noon when I start to get tired. Somehow, I fell asleep. 
There was a semi. He was running out of fuel. He had slowed way down. I came to right before impact. I don't know what prompted that. I don't know if that was God's providence. All I know is I came to and there was a semi. My immediate response was to crank the wheel to the left. There was pavement on our left. There was a ditch on our right. I cranked the wheel left, but it was too late. The back of that semi-trailer entered the chassis of our car. It passed inches from my face. The roof was torn down. I couldn't see what was in the seat next to me. After we stopped spinning in the ditch, I called her name. There was no response. At that point, it began to settle down on me what had possibly just happened. I was unhurt other than cuts and bruises. I jumped out of the driver's seat. I ran around the front of the car. And what I saw on the other side, I'll never get away from. I still see it in my dreams at night. Sometimes I still see it sometimes in flashbacks when I look at her picture on the wall. My sister did me the wonderful honor of naming her first daughter after Jacinda, Catherine Jacinda. And when I held that newborn in my arms and looked down at that beautiful child, all of a sudden I had a flashback right as I was looking at her face and I saw what I saw on the side of the road that day. I told you already in this meeting that early on in my journey, of recovery from that, God spoke to me and said, this was not an accident, this was my plan. And I embraced that. And that became the foundation of my healing journey. But I had so many questions. And friends, let me just pause and say, God doesn't mind our questions. There was a song that used to be sung when I was young and I apologize in advance if it's a song that you love. It says, I don't need to understand. I just need to hold his hand. I don't ever need to ask the reason why. Hogwash. I'm serious, folks. That's hogwash. What were some of Jesus' last words on the cross? My God, my God, why? Do you think he knew the answer? Oh, I think he did. But Jesus was human. And his humanity was crying out to his heavenly father, why? He had labored all night the night before in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Peter tells us in his sermon on the day of Pentecost, he says Jesus prayed all night like that with vehement cries. This is Jesus at his most painfully human. And yet he was the most sanctified, holy man who ever lived. Friends, God does not mind our questions. Do you know who doesn't like questions? Insecure people. Parents, what questions from your kids bugged you the most? The ones you didn't have a good answer for, right? (laughs) You can go ahead and nod your head. (laughs) I've never been a parent, but I've been a kid. (laughs) Friends, you'll never ask God a question that he doesn't have a good answer for. You'll never ask God a question that catches him off guard. The scripture says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and doesn't chide you for asking. In other words, God never swats us away and says, why are you asking so many pesky questions? Oh, friends, (laughs) I'm so thankful God's okay with our questions because let me tell you, I asked a million of them. And one of the burning questions that I asked the Lord was, Lord, 
I embraced the fact that this wasn't an accident. This was your plan. But why did I have to see her? Why do I have to have that picture in my mind? It comes to my mind right now as I talk about it. Lord, why? I asked that again and again and again. Early in the morning, I would get out of bed. It was still dark. I would walk the streets of my community because I couldn't sleep. And I would pour out my heart to God. And I asked and I asked and finally God answered that question. He doesn't always answer our questions. He doesn't always answer them in the way that we want him to. He doesn't always answer them when we want him to. He doesn't always give us a complete answer. <laughs> but he welcomes our questions. And he'll give us enough of an answer to give us the faith to be victorious over doubt. Hallelujah. <laughs> God answered my question. He said, Paul, I gave you a gift. I stopped dead in my tracks. I said, what? The Lord said, I gave you a gift. He said two things. He said, Paul, they quickly hustled you off in an ambulance. It seemed like the EMTs got there so quickly. He said, if you had had to leave the scene of that wreck wondering if she was alive or not, Wondering if she was going to make it. Wondering if she was hurting or not. Wondering if she was frightened or not. Wondering if she was asking for you or not. You would have had a whole different level of trauma than what you experienced. The Lord said, I let you see her so that you would know that she had died. And you started processing that immediately. But God didn't stop there. Secondly, he said... I let you see her because by what you saw, you knew that she had died instantly. She'd been asleep. She never knew what happened. She woke up in the arms of Jesus. My sisters and I sing a medley of songs about heaven. I had arranged it for my grandpa's funeral back in 2015. It's a grouping of old songs. And it's mostly older folk that are dwelling on heaven, right? Jacinda was a newlywed bride. She was focused on the here and now. She wasn't thinking about heaven, but she went with my sisters and me on a concert tour a few months before she died. And we sang that medley. And you know, it was the strangest thing because it was like she became obsessed with that medley. She asked me to play it for her over and over and over again. Finally, I sent her a link so she could listen to it on her phone. On her that's a fair question. And that's a question that we Christians shouldn't shy away from. Here's the answer. <laughs> God didn't create a world in which suffering existed. God created a perfect world. God placed the crown jewels of his creation, Adam and Eve, in a paradise. Do you realize that human history begins with paradise and it ends with paradise? That was God's plan all along. Well, preacher, what about all this mess in between? All this mess in between exists because of human choice. God didn't create the suffering in this world. We created the suffering by our choice to sin. How many of you would like to go on a date with a robot? Anybody? Nobody. Sometimes there's a little kid that will raise their hand and I say, you'll understand someday. <laughs> no, if a robot were to say, I love you, <laughs> It would only do so because someone had programmed it to do so, right? There's nothing special about a computer saying, I love you. Siri will tell you she loves you. But it doesn't send the chills up and down the spine like it did when Jacinda said those words. Why? Because a robot is not a person. 
When God created humanity, he did not create robots. He created us for the purpose of fellowship. He created persons, people with the capacity to make intelligent, moral choices. When he created us, he created us in his own image. That means that we are eternal beings just like he is. And so, therefore, our choices have eternal consequences. Yes, when God created real people with the power to choose, God opened the door to the possibility that we would reject his perfect will. And that's what we did. The scripture says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it is human choice that is at the root of all suffering. But friends, sometimes we push the blame off on God <laughs> for things that are our doing. I'm going to be painfully honest for a moment. Is that okay? If you've smoked all your life, don't blame God for your lung cancer. Amen? Amen. Don't lash out at God for this problem that has come upon you. If you have ignored the warning signs of your body, if you have mistreated your body, if you have abused your body, if you have neglected your health, don't lash out at God for the problems that result. God has created a world of cause and effect. Amen? Amen? However, I would quickly say that there are those who seem to have lived a very, very careful life who still experience great suffering. I can't help but think of Pearl Kaufman, Dr. Kaufman's wife. If ever there was a wonderful Christian lady, she was it. She was an angel. <laughs> she also was a nurse. She was very health conscious. She was very careful. She was always getting after me about how I eat and how I take care of myself. She took meticulous care of herself and her family, and yet she got cancer, and she died a painful death. How do we explain that, preacher? Well, first of all, we have to understand that the human race has made collective choices that have collective consequences. It was the sin of Adam, the federal head of the human race, that plunged our entire race and, in fact, the entire world under the pain of the fall. And therefore, both righteous and unrighteous experience pain. But friends... What's so beautiful about being a Christian is that as the Apostle Paul says, we can glory in our tribulations because our tribulations produce good. I pity those who experience deep pain who are not in a right relationship with God because so often that pain is simply wasted. Friends, we as Christians... When we experience deep pain, we can start looking for the silver lining, so to speak. We can start looking for God's purpose. We can start looking for ways that God wants to use that pain. I was talking to our sister last night. She was telling me about her eyes and how her eyes suddenly started going bad on her. And she said, I prayed, Lord, give me the right spirit to handle this. And she was talking about how she was riding Uber all the time. And all of a sudden, it came upon her that she could witness to those Uber drivers. She was telling me some stories about various Uber drivers to whom she had witnessed, some of whom she's followed up with, and God is working in their lives. Friends, there's purpose in our pain. Hallelujah. Yes, it's a matter of freedom. God created free choice, and free choice opened the door to suffering. But friends, it's also a matter of providence. Now, we Wesleyan Arminians, and by the way, it's Arminian, not Armenian. 
Armenian is an ethnicity. Armenian is a theology. <laughs> I went to a church recently and they had in, in a pamphlet out back, they had their beliefs and I thought that's great. You know, they, they've prepared for visitors, you know. And they said, we're Wesleyan Armenian and I thought, well, you're a lot lighter skin than you ought to be if you're Armenian. <laughs> they meant Armenian. <laughs> Arminian basically means we believe in free will. As Wesleyan Arminians, we sometimes are afraid of that word providence. That sounds Calvinistic. That sounds like predestination. <laughs> Friends, God is sovereign. God is in control. Yes, God has given us a measure of freedom to make choices. Maybe I could illustrate it this way. This is a painfully homespun illustration. I warn you ahead of time. If this Bible were an ant farm, and I began walking in this direction, and there was a little ant at this end of the ant farm that decided that he wanted to walk this direction. He could walk this direction while I'm walking that direction. He has a measure of freedom within this space. But if I'm walking in this direction and he's walking in this direction, what direction is he ultimately going in? He is ultimately going in the direction that I'm walking because I have ultimate control. And friends, I know that's painfully elementary. But God is in control. Yes, he has given us a measure of free will. Yes, we have the capacity to choose our eternal destiny. But as Dr. Emery used to say, you will bring glory to God. You will either bring glory to His justice in your damnation or you will bring glory to His mercy in your salvation. God is in control. God is sovereign. Yes, it's a matter of providence. I mentioned it last night, friends. Sometimes we have this tendency to want to play defense attorney in God's behalf. Oh, God didn't cause that. God just allowed that. Well, yes, friends, God will not override free will. And evil people make evil choices that have evil consequences. And God has restrained himself from interfering with those free choices. But there are also times when God in his sovereign providence does things that hurt. Listen to what he says in Isaiah chapter 45. I am the Lord, there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. Wow. God creates calamity. I, the Lord God, do all these things. I told you that God spoke to me and said, this was not an accident, this was my plan. That brought a measure of relief because I was blaming myself. But then that pressed upon me the deep, deep question, Lord, why? Do you know one of the first things God said to me? He used the words of an old song, a song that we seldom hear in church anymore. Oh, the cross has wondrous glory. Oft I've proved it to be true. When I'm in a way so narrow, I can see a pathway through. And how sweetly Jesus whispers, take thy cross and have no fear. For I've trod the way before thee and my glory lingers near. Oh, friends, <laughs> I can't tell you how that warmed my broken heart. Because what it said was, Paul, I'm in control. Yes, I have given you this cross to bear. But as you walk this road carrying your cross, you're going to sense the glory of my presence surrounding you. Hallelujah. 
because I have a plan. Friends, I used to fear providence. I used to recoil from the idea of providence. But do you know what I do now? (laughs) I lie back and rest in the stream of providence because God is in control and he works all things together for good. We can trust him. Hallelujah. (laughs) William Cowper, in one of the great hymns of the faith, says, Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Hallelujah. It's a matter of longing. It's a matter of longing. Paul says, we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. What are we longing for? We're longing for restoration. We're longing for deliverance. We're longing for that adoption that he talks about. Do you realize, friends, without pain, we humans would become quite satisfied with our silly little selves and the comfort zone we've created here on earth, failing to realize the incomprehensible beauty that God has in store. I know there are some fellow C.S. Lewis fans in the audience tonight, right? (laughs) Yes. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says about pleasure. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. (laughs) Wow. Friends, our pain stirs in us a longing for a better world. (laughs) It stirs in us a longing that helps us to rise above the materialism and the, the siren song of this society, so to speak. And we say, oh no, there's something better. Oh no, I'm living for something deeper, something more meaningful, something more lasting. Hallelujah. I'm not living for this world. I'm living for the world that is to come. Oh God, give us that longing. One more Lewis quote. Here's what he says about pain. We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Wow. (laughs) Pain is one of the most powerful tools in the hands of God to awaken us out of the stupor of earthly existence and to fix our eyes on the prize. Hallelujah. There was a lady named Martha Snell Nicholson. She lived in the late 1800s. She was diagnosed with a long, degenerative, painful illness. Her doctor told her, you'll slowly weaken and worsen. Life will become more painful. And finally, after a long period of suffering, you'll die. Imagine living in a world with no air conditioning and heat like we have today. Imagine living in a world with no Hoyer lifts and no adult diapers and no pain patches and no wheelchairs. Well, they had rudimentary wheelchairs, but not not the gizmos that we enjoy today. She lived in a difficult, difficult world. But do you know that instead of becoming bitter, she became better? And as she lay on that bed and stared at the ceiling, she began to compose poetry. And she became one of the great Christian poets of that era. Listen to her words. One by one, he took them from me. All the things I valued most. Until I was empty-handed. Every glittering toy was lost. And I walked earth's highways grieving in my rags and poverty till I heard a voice inviting lift your empty hands to me so I held my hands toward heaven and he filled them with a store 
of his own transcendent riches till they could contain no more. And at last, I comprehended with my stupid mind and dull that God could not pour his riches into hands already full. <laughs> oh, God, help us to get our hands empty. <laughs> God, help us to lift them heavenward and say, Lord, fill my hands with your transcendent riches. <laughs> Wean me away from the pleasures of this world. Finally, it's a matter of purpose. Philippians 3 Paul writes his own life verse. That's pretty cool to be able to write your own life verse, isn't it? You can do that when you're an apostle. What did he say? His highest aspiration was to know him, that is Jesus, in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. You know what the Hebrew writer said about Jesus? He said he was made perfect through suffering. Does that mean Jesus was full of imperfections? No, he was the Son of God. But the word perfect in the New Testament actually means complete. Jesus' earthly mission was made complete through his suffering. He came to suffer and die. The songwriter said, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? Ah, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. Oh yes, Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Amen. Yes, there's a purpose. We know Christ most intimately in the hour of suffering. Not long before I came here, I went to breakfast with a very, very dear friend of mine. Someone who was a listening ear to me all throughout my time of terrible struggle right now he and his wife are going through a time of very deep struggle and suffering and on the way home from that breakfast meal I remember looking at him calling him by name and I said don't take this wrong but I'm excited for you and he looked at me <laughs> like I was kind of crazy and I said, you're going to get to know Jesus more intimately than you've ever known him before. <laughs> we can know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. Yes, there is a purpose for pain. Friends, there's not only a purpose for us, but there's a purpose for other people. Because you see, as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. As you walk through the burning fiery furnace, other people will look on in amazement. In amazement that you can have hope. In amazement that you can have joy. I have a friend I went to school with many years ago. His parents lived next door to my grandparents on campus there at God's Bible School. We had a similar upbringing. We went to the same school, but he chose one path and I chose another. Over the years, his path has led him to lots of heartache, drugs and alcohol. He was the cat's meow. He was Mr. Cool. He was tanned. He had facial hair before anybody else. He had a real low voice. He had muscles. All the girls thought he was the cat's meow. But time hasn't been kind to Carl. I hadn't seen him since I had left GBS many, many years ago in 1995. But I began to see him on Facebook and one of the things that I noticed is that he was now calling himself an atheist and he was lashing out at people of faith. I never engaged with him. I could tell there was no point. If I had, it would have gone just like it did with others that engaged with him, just a, an argument that had no real purpose. But do you know that one of those mornings when I was walking the streets in my community, pouring my heart out to God, my phone rang. And on the other end was the deep voice of Carl. <laughs> he said, Paul, how are you doing? I said, Carl, 
I'm doing well. And he said, how? I said, Carl, I have one word for you. And that's Jesus. You see, Carl had been looking at my Facebook posts. God had put his thumb in my back and said, I want you to tell about your journey. I want you to tell about the dark times, but I want you to tell how I've come through for you. And I began to do that, and it started being shared all over the place, and people started seeing it, and Carl had somehow seen it along the way. And when I said, I have one word for you, and that's Jesus, Carl began to weep. <laughs> Big, bad Carl. He said, Paul... If I were in your shoes, I'd be buried in a bottle. He said, 30 years ago, we had the same upbringing. We had the same scenario, surroundings. But I chose one path and you chose another. And he said, Paul, for 30 years, my path hasn't been working. He said, I need what you have. <laughs> I got to pray with Carl that day. No, he's not a Christian yet. But I'm in touch with him. And I'm going to meet with him. And he's not calling himself an atheist anymore. <laughs> oh, friends, I can't help but think of those three Hebrew children. The king said to bow to the statue, they refused. The king called him into his courtroom and he said, maybe you misunderstood. I said bow. And they said, oh, king, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. Our God has the power to deliver us from your burning fiery furnace. But if he chooses not to, we still won't bow. The king was apoplectic. He said, heat the furnace seven times hotter. It was so hot, the soldiers that threw them in died as a result. The king and his courtiers are standing atop the embankment, looking down into the fiery furnace, and all of a sudden the king elbows the guy next to him, and he says, hey, didn't we throw three guys in there? And they say, yes. And he says, I see four, and the fourth one looks like the Son of God. <laughs> How did a heathen king recognize the Son of God? I'll tell you, friends, in exactly the same way your unbelieving friends and family members and neighbors and co-workers will recognize the stately presence of the Son of God as he walks with you through the burning, fiery furnaces of this life. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, yes, friends. There is a purpose in pain. Maybe you felt like Job. When he said, behold, I go forward and he's not there and backward, but I cannot perceive him on the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand and I cannot see him. In another verse, he says, oh, that I knew where I might find him. <laughs> Have you been there? I've been there. But he knoweth the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold hallelujah oh friends I know it's late but I got to tell you this one last story and then I'm done God had led me down this journey of healing step by step he'd answered question after question but there was one burning question that I couldn't get away from I said Lord I accept the fact that this was not an accident this was your plan I accept the fact that you have a purpose in my pain. Lord, I accept the fact that you gave me a gift when you allowed me to see her. But Lord, why did the wreck have to be my fault? Why couldn't it have been someone or something else, a drunk driver, a rock in the road, a mechanical failure, anything but me, Lord? I asked that again and again, and finally God answered that question. You know what he said? He said, Paul, if it had been something or someone else, you would have become bitter, and I couldn't have helped you. So Paul, I let it be your fault so that you would cast yourself on my mercy. And that put you in a place where I could help you. Once again, I stood there and wept like a child. If my neighbors had been looking out their window, it was too early for that. But if they'd been looking out their window, they'd have called the cops and said, there's a crazy man out here. <laughs> Why was I rejoicing? Because first of all, I knew deeply and profoundly how true that was. But secondly, I realized what a wonderful, loving Heavenly Father, I have 
who cared enough about me to hurt me deeply, but to do it in such a way that I would turn to him and he could put the pieces back together and he could start using it for his glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I said one last story, but I got to tell you one more real quick. I'll be quick. I promise. I forgot to tell you this one. There's a lady that lives catty cornered from my in-laws. Jacinda was the fourth generation on her family farm in Indiana. This lady, Sherry, lives catty cornered. She's the fifth generation on her family farm. She was a pig farmer. Just to be real blunt, she smelled like a pig farmer. She didn't change her clothes as often as she ought to. She didn't bathe and wash her hair as often as she ought to. She was unpleasant. She wasn't real nice to people. People didn't like Sherry. But Sherry had a soft spot for those little Edwards kids. And she particularly loved that beautiful little brown-eyed girl named Jacinda. <laughs> She'd give her candy. She followed her life and watched her grow up. Sherry wanted nothing to do with church or the Lord, even though her parents had gotten saved late in life. But my in-laws had been kind to her. And on the day Jacinda died, Sherry got a phone call. And she heard the news that that little Edwards girl that she had loved so much had died in a car wreck. Sherry fell on her knees and cried out to God. And God transformed Sherry. <laughs> I was visiting my in-law's house. There was a knock at the door. Lurie opened it and said, oh, Sherry. <laughs> After she had left, Lurie told me her story. She told me about how unpleasant she had been. But she said, Paul, she got saved that day. And she said, do you know she comes to church three times a week? She comes to ladies' prayer meetings. She makes snacks for the youth events at the steps in town. She said, she went with me to a ladies' retreat. She said, I had her to the house recently for a ladies' prayer meeting, and I called on her to pray. And she said, she prayed heaven and earth together. She prayed like an old saint, and all of us were in tears. <laughs> Sherry is thriving in Jesus today. Why? Because Jacinda died. Friends, don't miss the purpose in your pain. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow, for I will be with thee, thy trials to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake. I will never, no never, no never forsake. Don't miss the purpose in your pain. Let's stand together. Sing this with me. Tis so sweet. To trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to flow the same Can you testify? Jesus, Jesus, I grace to trust you more help us to turn our eyes upon you help us to look full in your wonderful face oh god don't let us waste our sorrows help us to come to know you intimately and deeply and personally as we walk through the valley thank you 
that you're a loving heavenly father oh God thank you that you can sanctify to us our deepest distresses Lord we trust you tonight drive away the doubts of Satan don't let Satan drive a wedge between these people who are suffering and the one source of hope and help they have oh God reveal yourself to them I pray as only you can and help us all to fix our eyes on you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you.